Last week, Jeremy filled in, praised Jesus, and taught on what is the gospel, kind of went on a topical study. Before that, we were in Romans teaching, um, you know, the, the powerful book, the book of Romans, full of so many doctrinal truths, and you know, we've covered chapters that deal with we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that there is no way to be just in the eyes of God except by faith, that it's by faith that we know we can know that we can have everlasting life and be forgiven, made justified by God. And those things give us a hope for heaven, it lets us endure uh, trials and struggles. And then Paul explained that, you know, even though we're, we're headed to heaven and we've had a Spirit of God that's inside of us that's changing us, we have the flesh that's still warring against us. You know, there's a battle going on in our life. We'll continue to go on until God delivers us from this body until He delivers us from this sinful world. And that's when He comes to take us home in the rapture, or if we die to go be with Him, we have this hope that the battle will be over. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to the battle. I don't know about you, but I, I hate just warring against my flesh, warring and saying, what, a, what a, all these useless things that we do in our life instead of doing what's important to God in every, in every way. You know, and, and the Holy Spirit, it, He does it. He's a gentleman. He's kind. He keeps doing it over the years and decades. And every year we should be drawing closer and closer uh, to Him. Romans 8 is really, as I said during the announcement time, it, it, it's an emphasis. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. If you know Jesus and the Holy Spirit's living in you, there's no condemnation. The law is not here to condemn because now you have a relationship with God. And then it goes on to say, and that doesn't mean life's going to be smooth. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be wonderful despite what the TV preachers say. God didn't come to save us so that we'd be rich and we'd be healthy and everything would be wonderful. We'd get that job. We'd get that promotion. That is not what Jesus came to do. He actually, as soon as we turn our life over to him, we become a bond slave of his. And he has ways of using us that we wouldn't have signed up for if we really knew and the day that we became a believer. Because he uses suffering, actually. Look at the life of Jesus. Did Jesus suffer on our behalf to be able to win the battle against the devil, Satan, at the cross? Did Paul suffer in his life? Yes, he suffered. Have the apostles suffered? Have the Christians throughout the centuries suffered? Are the Christians getting ready to be? Are, are the Christians suffering in the world today in different places? Yeah, he uses suffering because the world can't understand why people who suffer love Jesus. Why doesn't your God just give you a great time? Why doesn't he help you win the mega lottery? Why doesn't he, you know, and so many people, I, I, I bet you there's even Christians going, okay, God, you know, I, this is it. This is my dollar, and now I get to win. Or now it's $2. They, they knew they got a racket going, so they, I heard they upped it to $2. And, and so here's my $2, and I'll win the mega lottery. And, uh, and Jesus goes, no, I love you. I'm not going to let you win the mega lottery because it'd mess you up. And so, you know, just all these things the world's after, but we, we are serving Jesus, and he has a mission for us that we are taking by faith, not because it's going to be a great time, but because it's a meaningful time, because it's in God's plan a fruitful time, and God uses in this chapter many encouragements for us to endure the things that might go south in our lives. Ro Romans 8, 5 for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally or fleshly minded, to be just thinking apart from God, you know, basically before we're saved, we're of the flesh, we're carnal. We don't even care what God says. We don't care about it. We don't care what He says. All we care about is me. And what do I want to do? What do I want to do to enjoy? What do I want to do to seek a high? What do I want to do to seek the meaning of life? I'm only caring about me. And, uh, but to be carnally minded is death. If you live according to the Spirit, there's life. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity, fighting, is at war against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, because people don't care. When we become a believer in Jesus, we have a new mind. We have a new, the spirit inside of us starts to change and renews our mind, renews our heart. And now all of a sudden we go, wow, I do care what God says. I do care about the life that I've been living in rebellion against God. I want to stop, not because I'm going to get caught, 
not because somebody's going to arrest me, not because of anything else except my love for Jesus. See, this is what happens. The world can't understand it. The world can't understand a God inside of us that changes our attitude towards our Creator, who, who gave us His law for our own good. And we start, the Holy Spirit says, we're going to change. You're under new management. Um, and some people might be saying, well, Kevin, you know, there's people that they, they go to church, they do good, they do good things and stuff, but but the Bible says that people that do good things apart from faith in Jesus Christ are doing so for themselves. Because if you do things for God, you came through his son, Jesus. You come through Jesus because you say, God, I'm not a good person. I can't do it to earn my own righteousness and earn my way into heaven. I'm a sinner that should be on his way to hell or her way to hell. And so, God, I want to just receive the righteousness and the justification of Jesus and now just change me because I'm a sinful man. And see, when we do that, then that's pleasing to God, and then the Holy Spirit starts working. But see, there can be, you can be, there can be fake Christians, fake churchgoers, fake religious people doing good things, but they're doing it for better karma. They're doing it for, <laughs> as a, when I was a kid, uh, when I wasn't being totally corrupt, I was trying to be nice because I didn't want my karma to be bad because I was into reincarnation and evolution. And what's karma? Do, living for your better karma is what? It's self-centered. I just don't want to... Uh, <laughs> how many of you heard about those, uh, those baby wipes that clogged up a sewer system? Did you hear about that? And uh, there was a sewer system somewhere, and they had to send divers down 80 feet into the sewer system to go, because all those, uh, those things don't disintegrate, and uh, wouldn't want that job. Well, in India, if you're born into the lower class society in India, you're, you're a sewer diver. Because, and, you know, that's what, your karma, you must have done something bad in the last life. That's why you're born into that caste society. You get the sewer job. And... Well, I didn't want to get the sewer job in India, so I didn't do, I wasn't as corrupt as some other people that I used to hang around with. It's all self-centered. The only thing that's not self-centered is, Jesus, forgive me, a sinner. Jesus, I need you to save me. So then, verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh, not saved, cannot please God. Um, they're not trying to please God. They're trying to please themselves. And their mind of what they think they need to do to be pleasing to God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So, so he's saying there's this promise. This promise is that if you're not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit. The, the Spirit of God is now inside you, changing your life and giving you a new outlook. Uh, and then Paul stops and says... I'm writing this letter to the Romans, and some guys might be reading it in the Roman church that are fake, that aren't part of the church, really. And he's saying, if indeed, if indeed the Holy Spirit is inside you, working in you, um, and everybody else, everybody here, what Paul is saying to every one of you, have you sensed the Spirit of God? Have you sensed the Spirit of God crying out, Abba, Father, as we're going to see in a few verses? A Spirit of God where all of a sudden you're really realizing, I want to please Jesus in my life. You're not trying to be good, not trying to fit in, you're just wanting to please Jesus. Because if that's true, then the Holy Spirit's in you. You should have sensed that time where he came in. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. What does that mean? What, what does it mean? If, you, if the Spirit of Christ is not in you, you're not his. That means God doesn't know you. And if God doesn't know you, then what does that mean? That means that when you die, you're separated from God. And that's what we have to realize when we have compassion for our friends, our neighbors, and everything else, what we're telling them is you have to have Jesus. Because if you don't have the biblical Jesus, if you, don't have, if you haven't gotten on your knees and had that time where the Holy Spirit changes you and all of a sudden you care about what God says and you want his life to change you, then you're not his. And on that day that you stand before the God of the creator of the universe, and he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. That'll be a terrible, terrible day. And it is the reality. It is what will happen to every single one of our friends, neighbors, acquaintances who has not bowed the knee to Jesus and received the gift 
of everlasting life, the Holy Spirit inside their life. So there is nothing more important than to know that we are His. And we know we are His because we sense Him inside of us. We know He has changed. He is changing my mind. I knew it the day I got saved. I wasn't just, the day I got saved, I knew something just happened. I, I'm thinking different. I want to read my Bible. I, actually, I want to get a Bible so I can read my Bible. I want to go find out what this God says. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead. By faith, we have now said, I am dead to this world. I don't want to live for this world anymore. The body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Paul is saying, if you sense the Holy Spirit inside of you, then just think, Jesus rose from the grave, and therefore death will never have a part of your life ever again. Your body might die, your, this tent will die, get sick and die, or, go, or die suddenly, but the resurrection of Jesus is resurrection in your life, in your spiritual life, and you're going to go to be with God in heaven forever. And really, we're going to have a baptism after church today, and I emphasize this every baptism because of this verse, you know, later on, in, as it talks about, or, or earlier in his Corinthian letter, Paul talked about how we're buried with him in baptism. Technically, what we're saying when we're saved is, God, I am done living my life for myself. Bury it. Put it in the water dead. But I'm alive now to live for you. And although there's still dead things that we take part in, there's still sinful things that we do, the real us, the real real soul that has been rejuvenated by the Holy Spirit and being changed has a promise of everlasting life. And we yearn for it. We know it's going to be true. Um, we don't have to wonder, did I do enough? Did, did I go to Mass enough this week? Did I say enough Hail Marys? Did I do enough good things? Did I put enough money in the plate? Did I do this? Did I do this? And that? No, Jesus erased all that. No, Jesus, I need your justification. I need your, your gift of forgiveness upon my soul. And once we sense that and we know that, we know it's not working for salvation. Jesus gave us salvation. He wanted the relationship. He wanted us to just simply say, I want you to be my God. And when we do that, he embraces us as a child and then starts changing our hearts. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors. We are in debt. We're horribly (laughs) in debt in a way that we're not going to matter. We're not going to care about being in debt. You know what our debt is? to love the Jesus who so loved us, he sent God to save us from our sins, sent Jesus to save us from our sins. And we're, how long is that going to last? For all of eternity. We're going to be so indebted to love the God who loved us so much to save us. Not to the flesh. We owe nothing to our flesh to live according to the flesh, but we are now to live towards God. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Um, 1 Peter 1.18, I like to emphasize this, it's a frequently referenced verse, can't get enough of it actually, can't be reminded enough, this is what Peter wrote on this subject, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. What, what is it that allowed us to have everlasting life? What is, it allow, what is it that God gave us? What did God have to do to make it so he could declare us righteous in his eyes? Not because we were, but because he took the righteousness of his son and put it upon us, and he washed us, he covered us with Jesus, and he sees us as Jesus in righteousness. What, what is it that made that happen? The shed blood of Jesus on the cross. Going to 1 Peter 4, 3, as a result of that, see, when we know that Jesus bought us with his precious blood, then 1 Peter 4, 3 kind of 
is, so what should happen as a result of that? This is how our attitude changes. This is what the Holy Spirit does inside of our life, is He, he lays this burden upon us. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, doing the will of the flesh, doing the will of the devil. When we walked in lewdness, walked in lewdness, you know, just the, the vile, new, naked, you know, immoral world that we have all around us. We've done enough of that. We've done enough drunkenness, wouldn't you say? A true believer should, should be saying, I should be done with drunkenness. I don't want to be drunk. Why? Because the Word of God says the devil is walking around seeking whom he may devour. How many of you, you know, as a true believer, how much do we want to hang around being devoured by Satan? He, he the Bible says Satan is looking for people inebriated to do his bidding through them. And we as Christians can do that. I mean, people can, a Christian, a true lover of Jesus, can fall into sin, but what he's doing is he's, he's getting right in Satan's playground and bad things always happen. Always. So, don't let it happen. Drunkenness, revelries, riotous living, drinking parties. So, I guess you, you know, I don't, I don't get drunk. I just go to drinking parties. <laughs> I have no desire to go to a drinking party. I have no time. You know, God took away 43, 44, 44 years ago, took away my desire to go to parties, world parties. Used to do it. What else was there to do? When you're serving the flesh, serving yourself, serving everything, what else is there to do but just live for yourself, live for the next high, live for this or that? And, and yet, when you come into true life, there should be a change that just is going to change, and you're going to say, I don't want to do that anymore. Why well, go to a party when nobody wants to talk about Jesus without using his name as an adjective instead of the noun of the God that we love so much because he loved us. Drinking parties, abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation. Flood of dissipation is just debauchery. Just, why aren't you partying with us anymore? And you look at them and you say, because you're disgusting. Because the party life is empty, death, disgusting. And they speak evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Back to Romans 8, 12. It's okay when they hate you because you don't party with them anymore because we, you know, what God does for the Christian is he gives us a future vision. He's like he gives us you a spotting scope. You can see things way far away, clearly. And when you can see way, 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 way far away, what do we see with our spot, a spiritual spotting scope? Way, way far away. Heaven, hell. Jesus' life, Satan in the flesh, and serving the devil, death, destruction, misery. And, we, and so when they call us, hey, you're not with us. Well, yeah, I, I see where your path goes. It's misery all along the way, and then it ends in eternal damnation separated from the God who loves you. I want to stay on this path. I don't care what you think. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, back at Romans 8, we, we are debtors, not to the flesh. We've been purchased by the blood of Jesus to no longer have to be servants of our flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, if you live in it, if you want that party still, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I love party, and there's something wrong with the first part of your statement. Because God takes away the love for partying and living in the flesh. He takes it away. You might, be, you might find yourself in it, but you're not. You might find yourself falling in it, but you're not living in it if you're a true believer. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death over the years, you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Again, I hope I'm talking to saved people here. If I am, I'm talking, I can simply say, then you know you're being led by God. You're, you're living your life to please the God who saved you. You don't always do so, but you rejoice of his, in His forgiveness each time, and you say, I want to be done with it. God, let your Holy Spirit convict me next time. I want to have nothing to do with that fleshly indulgence that messed with my life. 
And then, what, and then what God is saying, yes, because you're my son, I will give you that sanctified life over time. I will remove these things. I will show you how to die to the things of the flesh. Um, the Spirit inside us gives us an inner power because he speaks to us gently, lovingly. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You know, there's people that have spent a whole study on Abba, Father. It, it really is, it's like saying Daddy, Daddy. That's really in the, in the Greek. It's like Daddy, Daddy. It's, it really is likened for all of you that have been estranged from your dad because of whatever reason. And some of it might have been just horrible things your parents did, you know, which is, you know, forget that estrangement. We, we, we come to the God who created everything. He's never done us wrong. He's never, he's never done anything but love his creation that's been fighting him for thousands of years to send Jesus. And when we finally realize, what am I doing fighting this God? And we come to his knees and we say, we believe, I believe in your son Jesus. I want to live for you. And he just picks us up. He says, come on, just, just like a father that loves a son or a daughter, no matter how old they are, that they just break down and they want to stop fighting. They want to just start loving. They want to, I want to stop rebelling against you. I want to stop sneaking out. I want to stop cussing at you. I want to stop. I just want to love you because you're my parent. Isn't that an awesome thing when that happens? And it's the same way to God. He's just... He sees a billion people, you know, has billions of people here on earth, and he's just reaching out to him. Oh, I wish you would come up into my lap and say, Daddy, Daddy. I wish you would just. Put down your fighting. The Spirit himself, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits. See, the Holy Spirit's in us with our rejuvenated, alive spirit, that we are children of God. We get to actually realize that we're a child of God. How cool of a thing is that? (laughs) To have a relationship. I, I get really blessed with many of you share with me your stories of how you witness to people and they say, you know, people will always say, oh, you're religious. Or for me, they'll find out I'm a pastor and they'll, and they'll cuss and swear and, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot you're, you're religious. And, and what I get so blessed with is hearing you doing what should be done by everybody. If you haven't heard this yet, I'm not religious. I tell them that. I am not religious. You're a pastor. You said you're, uh, you're a pastor, whatever. Uh, no, I have a relationship with my Jesus. I have a relationship with God. I'm not, religion is man trying to work his way some way, somehow, to be God, to be good enough to get to God, to be good enough to get to heaven, or to not even believe that there is a God that they have to answer to. Christianity alone is a relationship. Abba, Father. Change me from the inside out. You don't deserve to forgive me, but I thank you that you sent Jesus so I could be forgiven. And we have a relationship with God. They don't understand that. Bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Um, Heirs of God... What is, that, what is that worth to you? Think about that. It, it, you know, inheritors of everything that God, Jesus, has inherited, which is everything. Heirs of God. Do you think that beats the mega lottery? <laughs> it, it amuses me. And because it's, na- you know, it's now the biggest lottery in the world ever, and everybody's going nuts. Even my wife was forced by her coworkers, you know, Juanita, you know, you have to put into it. What if you're the only one that doesn't put into it? And we score, then what are we going to do? You're going to feel so bad. Uh, so, 
And really, what should our attitude be with that? Oh, no, I'm, I already won the lottery. And it's trillions, trillions of dollars. I just haven't gone and collected it yet. I have to die to do that. But then I go and collect on it forever and ever and ever. And what's really sad is that you haven't even bought a ticket. You have any, and it's a guaranteed winner. You're, you, you're going with odds. You, you want to put a bunch of money on one in 300 and some million odds. Do you realize that's, that's like when you feel like going and paying tomorrow to go get a lottery ticket? Think about this. You buy one penny, and everybody in the, world, in the country has one penny, and they put it in the big penny pot. And then you stir it all up, and you're thinking, I'm going to have the chance of picking out that one in 350 million penny. And that's, you know, so again, the lottery is for people that failed statistics in college. <laughs> and, and so this is a little remedial training so that you don't get swept up into the worldly way of thinking. Right? And, and again, I've said, if God wanted me to win the lottery, he could do it with one dollar. And the odds could be one in a trillion. But see, God, again, the world is after this. This will solve my problems. This is my hope. This is, this is my future. And one guy was on the TV, and he was sitting there and going, it's my time. I'm doing this because it's my time. Well, he, he's a false prophet because he didn't get it. <laughs> you know what? The Bible says it's our time to, what does it say? Anybody know? Today, today is the day of salvation. Today is the appointed time. Everybody, today, it, it, we should tell people, oh, you want, you think it's your time? Well, then that, it, it is. The Bible says now is the time to get on your knees before Jesus and ask for everlasting life, forgiveness of sin. And then you get something better than a lottery ticket because we inherit, we inherit everything from God. Um, joint heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him. What was unique about Jesus? Was he of this world? He was absolutely not of this world. He was, unlike anybody that has ever lived in a human body, he was not here for himself. He was not here to party. He was not here for anything except to obey the Father all the way to the cross, being crucified on our behalf so that we could have life and forgiveness. And you know what we have to do to follow in his footsteps to not be about us and to be about him and obeying the Father is we have to suffer in this world. Being a biblical Christian is not party time. It is not enjoyable. Studying to show ourselves approved, a man rightly dividing the word of God, having an answer for the hope that's within us so that we can share with others is a tedious, difficult, time-consuming process. It's not fun, except for the joy of seeing the Lord work through us and ministering to others. It's the only thing that makes, makes uh, yeah, but it, it takes suffering. It takes suffering by people calling you names. It takes suffering about being excluded. It takes suffering by the persecution of those that are in other parts of the world that are simply being asked, are you going to deny Jesus Christ? And if they say no, they get killed and sometimes tortured before they are. It takes, Jesus saying, you want to be an heir, you're going to be suffering because he's going to make us like him. They hated Jesus, they'll hate you. Timothy, Paul said to Timothy, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And we've seen it happening by people that want to have God-fearing love for God. Um, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Uh, you know, Paul was writing this six years before major persecution came to Rome. It was already starting. People were already kind of fed up with Christians in Rome. But when Caesar Nero came to power, he burned down Rome to blame it on the Christians, and then persecution started in earnest. And we're talking feeding them to the lions, burning them at the stake, tarring, and tarring Christians, putting them on a pole, tying them to a pole, lighting them uh, to turn into torches for 
races that he would have in his backyard. Un unimaginable persecution that Paul is writing, if indeed we suffer and we'll be glorified together. And those days haven't come to America, praise God, but they could, and then the answer is going to be, and if the Holy Spirit's inside of us, and He owns us, and if we're a truly a slave of His, what, could they, what can they do to us to make us say, deny Jesus, you know, make us deny Jesus? It, it's impossible because we have the spotting scope. We know where we're going. We know that this flesh is going to die someday, but our spirit is going to be with Him. For I consider, verse 18, the sufferings of this present time, and you might even write in your Bible because it's true, the sufferings of this present short time, right? But what if I live to be 100? Short time. Because eternity is long. Life is short. Eter life in the flesh is short. Eternity is long. For I consider that the sufferings of this present short time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We need to spend more time thinking about the glory that's coming. Are you suffering persecution? Are you suffering hardships in life? Is something going on in your family that you wish wasn't? Hardships, estrangements, things with your family, with your children, with your finances, with your job, with your friends, with your neighbors, not worthy to be compared with where I'm going. It's hard to keep that in mind. But we must. This, is, this chapter was given to us by the Holy Spirit to let us just get into our prayer time and say, God, it's horrible. It's tough. You know, Will, going through all this physical pain that I can't imagine, I, and almost seemingly no hope for dealing with what has happened, you know, by man's failure on the offering table and going through all this stuff, and, it, and yet, not worthy to be compared to the glory of a new body forever in heaven with God, where all the tears are wiped away, the former things remember no more, and we're <laughs> rejoicing with the angels forever at the feet of our precious Jesus. Um, for the earnest expectations... Uh, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Um, the, worship, the creation is, uh, they can't wait till this place gets fixed. Uh, it goes on to say that all of creation, imagine when, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, it, it didn't seem weird to Eve that she's talking to some animal, maybe because we got to talk to all the animals. Got to talk to every, uh, every animal of creation. Uh, Adam was given the chore of naming the creation. And maybe a couple times he sits there and goes, what do you want to be named? Running out of names. <laughs> and they could have chimed in. See, he wasn't blown away by talking to this created creature. When it, maybe we're going to go back into an eternal condition and we're talking with the animals. And what the Bible says is that the creation, which did not sin, you know, our dogs and cats and all the pets and all the things that God has given us to enjoy in life, they didn't sin. They got subjected to dealing with our sin. They got, they got put into a different world without their permission because of us. And what if when they're, you know, licking us for the doggy biscuit, what they're really all excited about, you think this is good, wait until Jesus comes and fixes this place and makes it heaven on earth again. You know, maybe that's what they're thinking. It kind of leaves us with that view. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. You know, all of creation is, is going to be considering it glorious for us to be in the liberty of the eternal heaven, the heaven on earth for a while, for a thousand years. Creation is going to rejoice finally. You know, it says in the Bible that the angels of God rejoice over the conversion of one person. So whenever anybody becomes a believer in Jesus, the angels are rejoicing. And so all of creation is corrupted, but creation is just yearning for the day. It's going to be all over. Um, 
We're not alone in our suffering. Creation is suffering too, waiting to be uncursed. You see a little bit of in Isaiah 11 and 65. I have that in your notes. You can read that sometime. We know it got cursed. Genesis chapter 3, it says when, when God started dealing out the curses, he put a curse on, on the creation. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles that were bring forth. Before the creation, there was no thorns, thistles. And, you know, I don't know, because the Bible doesn't say about other stuff, like mosquitoes and um, ticks. And <laughs> my, my grandson had a tick crawling on him the other day when we were in eastern Washington. And he just, I hate ticks. <laughs> You know, all, the, all these things that create problems now for human beings, snakes that bite, all those things. In the, uh, Isaiah eleven sixty five, 65, it says that a child will put his hand on an adder, a, a poisonous snake's den, and will not be hurt because creation's going to be restored. And right now, all of creation is just moaning. It's groaning for the day that we're manifest sons of God, and it's over when Jesus comes back as an environmentally friendly God. Um, he'll fix the planet. I saw a sign yesterday when he and I were, we went to this place and there were some shops in there. One of the sh shops had some wine and they had a sign up that said, save the earth. It's the only, it's the only planet that has wine. Um, as they were selling wine. But our, our sign is save the earth and, you know, save the earth to restore it to the way you intended it for the sons of God who would be coming back. See, that's, our hope is not to go party, go get drunk, you know, say, hey, save the planet, we got a party. That's what that sign was saying. No, Jesus, chapter 8 of Romans, save the planet so they can rejoice that you saved man, so that you restore us to uh, the way you intended it to be in the beginning. Verse 22, for we know that the whole earth, the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. See, our soul has been redeemed already by faith in Jesus Christ, but aren't we waiting for a body that won't ever corrupt, a body that will never, ever desire to sin anymore, as we've already covered, the Bible promises us? You know, we should, we yearn for, a, I want to go home. Do any of you feel like, man, I, I just, I want to go home? How many of you have traveled overseas and you're so excited to go someplace overseas, but it doesn't take long, right? It doesn't take long until you're saying, I just want to be home. And see, we were the same way. We, we were originally created by God to be in a heaven with him forever and ever and ever. And then we got plunged into this corrupted, fallen world, and we thought that's all that there was. We're just joining the rest of the world in corruption. And then we found out, no, no, you can go through the door Jesus and the door Jesus, by faith, you'll have everlasting life to be the way it was supposed to be. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, he says, it's going to be wonderful. Here's a spotting scope. Can you see it over in the distance? And you go, yes. And we just yearn, oh, can't we just go home? Can't we just be done with the death of loved ones? Can we stop being, being groaning with the decay of our bodies and the diseases that happen, little you know, our children that have to go to the hospital to Mary Bridge because an infection happens in a gland and, um, you know, a, again, a surgery botched, the effects of sin in the world and what we see all around us. And have you noticed that our world just seems to be devouring itself now? Just people on both sides are just devouring. And don't you just yearn for the day there will be none of that ever, ever, ever again? that everybody will be worshiping King Jesus who knows the, he's the way, the truth, and the life. There will be no alternate opinion because everybody that goes to heaven ha doesn't have an alternate opinion because we came to heaven not to fix it, not to change God's plan, but to embrace that he alone is God. And how can you argue with God? 
He knows what's best, and so I just want what he wants. And see, that's what's so cool is by our own free will, he is allowing us to come in, and we will never, ever want to fight with God like some of the angels did, deceived by Satan. And and so we're going to be there. We're going to get there because here on this corrupted earth, we said, forget the stupid earth. I want Jesus. And so when no earth and no fleshly body is there to even tempt us, how wonderful is that going to be? If we want to serve him now, What's it going to be like when we don't even have the temptations to not serve him? It's going to be glorious. And so we eagerly waiting for the adoption, the time our bodies are done. For we were saved from sin and death in this hope that we get to be in heaven with the God of the universe. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. And that's why we wait. It's, we have to come to God by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He, it is a test. What do you want? You want the world or you want God? And so we're in this test. And he lets us, here's the world in your face. Here's the options in your face. If if the world can sit there and go, deny Jesus or you can't party with us. Oh, okay, forget Jesus, I want to party. God says, oh, all right, I see your real heart. You're not a true child of God. You haven't been born again. This is the testing ground, world or life in Jesus Christ. And um, we have to wait for it. People think we're nuts. I'm waiting for heaven. Oh, you're such a nutcase. Yep, but I see it by faith. I know it's coming, but I have to wait for it. You guys can have your pleasures now, but you're going to have a lack of pleasure for all of eternity because you didn't believe and trust in Jesus. You know, one of the things I like about email updates and the technology is you order a package on the East Coast, you know, and you order something on Demon Amazon. (laughs) So, the empire, <laughs> one of these days, the empire will strike back. So, you order something on Amazon, and, and now you can sit there and, oh, it says, okay, it left the factory in Virginia, and, oh, okay, I wonder if it's going to come flying, or if it's going to come by ground, or whatever else, and then, oh, it's arrived in Seattle, and then after a while, they go out for delivery, and you go, oh, it's coming to my house. It's ready. It'll be there today when I get home, and you know all about it. You know what this is, you know what this is basically telling us with the stuff we talked about during announcement times, the things that are happening that are associated with the revelation and everything? It's out for delivery. It's here. We're in the last of the last of the last days. Jesus is out for, de- you know, he ha- truly, he hasn't left the side of the Father yet because otherwise we'd be gone. But I mean, it is so close that it's like you know it's here. It's coming. It is time to double down on our loves and affections for Jesus. Um, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You ever feel that way? And, uh, you know, and some people, they, they say, you know, gift of tongues is for today. We, our church, we believe that, that the Spirit is there. Not that we don't abuse it, but sometimes it's okay to just say, God, I don't, I'm so grieved with what's going on with my family. I'm so grieved. I don't even know what to pray. And, you, and just groaning in God. Maybe the Lord will just, the Holy Spirit will come over you and you'll speak in a language that you don't know. But to just groan. Because sometimes we just don't know. And it says that the Holy Spirit himself will make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 11. We'll let Paul expound on this. this. This is one of the very first memory verses I learned. And it's a memory verse that should be in all of your minds. Because 
trials do come to our life. And we have no understanding of why. We don't understand. I mean, I still don't understand why Will has to go through what he goes through. But God does. And I don't understand why Frankie Palermo, and you know what he was so thankful for when I told him the other day, or when I was talking to him a couple days ago? He, he was just so thankful that the Lord allowed it to not happen until he had done all but the last two services. And, a, and actually, here he is, 80 some years old, and he's the energizer buddy. <laughs> Takes a lick and keeps on ticking. He just, all he wants to do is tell people about Jesus. He's going to keep doing it until he drops. And he had Judy take him to the pulpit, and he preached blind the Sunday morning service. But <laughs> he, he couldn't. He said, I, I, can't, I can't do the Sunday evening service. Thank you, Jesus, that it was at the very end. Sorry I missed the Sunday evening service. Heads back to Florida. The, o- the only way we can have this attitude is by the Holy Spirit being inside of us. The only way we can have that attitude is having the spotting scope saying, I know where I'm going. And the only other way we can have this attitude is by knowing, I'm serving you. You're my master. Everything that happens in my life is to your glory. I don't care what it is. And I don't, under- I don't have to understand it. I don't understand it. I don't have to understand it. I just know that I am yours. 2 Corinthians 11.22 Paul was dealing with false prophets that were coming behind him, false teachers coming into the churches he had birthed in Corinth. And, and they come behind him and they go, oh, Paul's not really apostle, we're hot stuff. And you know, they, they set up their TV shows and they're preaching for bucks, whatever else they were doing. And Paul is coming and he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. You know, they were, oh, we're Jews, we believe in Jesus, and here you got to be circumcised is what they were saying. We know from other scriptures, so am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. And then he goes into what he endured as an apostle of Jesus. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measures, meaning I've been beat. I have been beaten for teaching people about Jesus. In prisons, more frequently. In death, softened, threatened with death. How many of you go to your workplace and they hate you because you're a Christian and they say, you know what? I'm going to kill you. Don't know when, but any day now. And you see him walking around your house. You see him waiting outside your house. I mean, he, he knew they were going to kill him in Damascus and, and the Christians had to lead him out, let him out on a basket through a window on the wall of Damascus. He knew they were going to kill him. When he was in... And actually, after this letter, he, he gets arrested in Jerusalem, and there again, these, these guys took an oath, we will not eat again until we kill Paul. They took a Jewish oath to not eat again until they kill him. And so Paul would have been sitting there going, oh, man, 40 Jews took an oath, to, they're not going to eat until they kill me? Well, when they get hungry, they're going to really try hard. <laughs> And he goes, maybe I'm going to die, but God had told him he wasn't because he was going to go to Jerusalem. Comforted him. Actually, God came and comforted him. No, you've spoken to me here, and now I'm going to send you to Rome. Then Paul knew, oh, okay, I guess I'm not going to die. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. I don't even think my dad, for whooping me for stealing stuff out of cars, was 40. And it was bad. And so 40 times, imagine adultish whippings where you get it five times, you know, three times, or, uh, you know, five times, you get 40 stripes, rips your back open. Three times I was beaten with rods, once with stone, three times I was shipwrecked, night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, and in the wilderness. I, I, every, I go into the city, I'm hated. I go into the wilderness, and there's people there that are ready to roll me on the road. In perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. That, I bet you that one hurt the most. Goes, you know, gets involved in the church, and he realizes some of them are playing church, but they're serving Satan. 
And then they, they come in and try and destroy the ministry that God had given to Paul. In weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, and hunger and thirst and fastings often, and cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Now, all this stuff happened to me, but what really bothers me is how's the church doing in Corinth? How's it doing in Ephesus? How's it doing in Philippi? How's it doing in Thessalonica? How are the, I know they're being persecuted. I wonder what the false teacher's trying to do to mess with them. He's just driven for the mission that God had given him. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which contain, concern the things which concern my infirmity. Now that's not, that's not health wealth message right there. And that goes with, we know that all things work together. God has chosen, running out of time, God has chosen for the life of the Christians to not be easy street. And in Paul's life, you know, there was times that you can see deep despair and discouragement in his life, right? He, he tells the Corinthians, the more I love you, the more you hate me. He says to Timothy, come and bring me my coat because nobody, winter's coming, and I'm shivering. I don't have a coat. He ministered, this is in Rome. He's ministered this letter to the Romans, and he has to write Timothy to bring him a coat because Nobody in Rome cared enough about him to bring him a coat. Probably, don't know, probably because what happens if you go to visit Rome, or visit Paul in the Roman jail when he's being sent to probably to be uh, killed, uh, what's going to happen to you? What's going to happen to you is, oh, you want to bring a, a coat to Paul? <laughs> Why don't you join him? And then you can fight over the coat. And so he, he sits there and he goes, everyone has left me. I can't imagine. <laughs> you know, we, we all suffer emotional issues, but when I think about Paul, and yet here we are 2,000 years ago reading this stuff, he was probably going, what's the, what's the value of it? The most value is what he went through and he still loved Jesus. And, and we wouldn't have had that if he was like, oh, you know, I... Uh, somebody from the future came and brought me a, a Lamborghini to be able to go to, to Rome with and, you know, and didn't have to use oxygen. Everybody's wondering why I'm, I just have all this technology to make everything so easy. No, God makes it hard so that people say, what's with them? Um, may God help us to just allow, and it goes on, the chapter finishes with this same theme, which we're out of time for, but uh, we'll pick it up next week. But, um, I was talking to somebody with cancer this week. They've been fighting it for years, went into remission, came back, massive, um, you, know, the, you know, cancer. My wife is an oncology nurse. She sees it too. There's the hope that everything's okay. She loves Jesus. Been very involved in fighting different battles, spiritual battles, and um, she's discouraged because this last chemo treatment that they're saying, okay, we got to hit it with this now because it didn't work. And it's just, it just wiped her. And it's not making the cancer markers go away. And so just, she was discouraged. And, and it was Romans 8 mindset. You know, in this world we will have tribulation. And God is in control. God can use this. We've got to remember, if I was in your place, what I want to remember is the spotting scope, the light at the end of the tunnel. And by the grace of God, God will, God will cause something to happen, a healing. We prayed for her healing. We prayed God would have, you know, give the doctor's wisdom what kind of chemistry to use. But we know how it ends. See, the thing is, is when we know how it ends, it can take the discouragements of a body racked with cancer, racked with the effects of chemo, racked with not being able to do the things that you used to be able to do, and give you a hope, and give you peace, and give you joy. And she was thankful for that reminder. 
And this chapter is for us to help others in ministering that hope to them. And realizing that the people that have not that hope, think how bad it is for them. They're, they're, they think that this life, the next party, is all I have to live for. That's all that there is. And think how miserable that is. When we know ultimately, even if the cancer goes away today, ultimately I'm going to be dying somehow and living with no hope. We have the hope of everlasting life. And it's in our heart through the Holy Spirit telling us that we believe and trust in Jesus and we're an adopted child of his and we're sitting in his lap worshiping him as Abba Father. And he's coming soon. He's going to take us home and we're going to be with him. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the hope that you've given us. As Peter said, I just thank you that it's a living hope. It's one based on the resurrected Jesus who took power over death, allowed his body to be crucified on our behalf so that we could be given life and forgiveness and righteousness in your eyes. God, help us to always remember that. Help us, Lord, to weather these storms of life that, that come our way. Help us to be a witness to those that are around us that there is something different about the way the way the storms affect us because we know that the storms come that everything is working out together for good for those that love God and we love you Lord and are called according to your purpose and God we know that you have a plan for our life and that plan is to be ultimately sitting in your lap for all of eternity as you wipe away the tears we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy God of all creation, you bring life to all who seek your face. Yeah. So we lift our hands, our hearts and sweet. your name in all these